Every American knows the name Benedict Arnold. Most think they know the full story, but do they? His name is synonymous with high treason and treachery. But very few people know the real story behind the man, what he accomplished, what his fellow leaders felt about him, what his men thought of him, and why he did what he did. Who was Benedict Arnold? What was his record of service to the American Continental Army? What did his superiors, such as George Washington, think of him? What were the circumstances of his treason? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. Benedict Arnold IV was born on January 14, 1741, in Norwich, Connecticut, the last of six children to Benedict Arnold III and Hannah Waterman Keene. Only Benedict and his sister Hannah survived to adulthood as their other four siblings died of yellow fever as children. His mother's family, the Kings, were very wealthy merchants, but his alcoholic and competent father made bad decisions and gambled away the family's wealth and their estate. Needing work and an income, the young Arnold became an apprentice to an apothecary business, and in the Seven Years' War, which lasted from 1756 to 1763, better known to Americans as the French and Indian War, expanded from Europe into the British and French colonies, he tried to volunteer in 1755, but his mother refused to give her permission, which was required. But in 1757, he did enlist in the Connecticut militia when he turned 16 years old, and his unit headed toward Albany and Lake George, New York. The French attacked and successfully laid siege to Fort William Henry in northeastern New York, and their Indian allies had committed atrocities against wounded soldiers and civilians. After a messenger rode and informed Arnold's unit of what had happened, the commander turned the company around. As a result, Arnold only served for two weeks. In 1767, he became a successful businessman and married Margaret Mansfield, and the couple had three children before Margaret's death in 1775. As storm clouds gathered once again, Arnold joined the Continental Army and was given a captain's commission from Massachusetts, and he participated in the battles of Lexington and Concord. Afterward, Arnold joined the Vermont militia leader, Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys, who executed the mission to capture Fort Ticonderoga from the British in upstate New York on May 10, 1775. Arnold had also launched a bold raid of his own on Fort St. Jean on the Richelieu River north of Lake Champlain, and when the Connecticut militia force arrived at Ticonderoga in June, Arnold and the militia commander disagreed over control of the fort. Arnold resigned his commission and was on his way home from Ticonderoga when he learned that his wife Margaret had died earlier in June. Arnold's men remained loyal to him because of his bravery under fire. Arnold met with General George Washington in Cambridge, Massachusetts after the Second Continental Congress authorized an invasion of Quebec, which Arnold suggested. Arnold was then asked to rejoin the army, and he agreed and was given the rank of colonel and 1,100 men, and Arnold laid out his plan by moving his soldiers through the dense forest and wilderness route through Maine. But, as Arnold stated, it would require a coordinated attack. Washington and Congress liked his plan, but Arnold was passed over for promotion to Brigadier General and not given command of the operation. General Richard Montgomery was placed in command. Arnold knew that the mission had to be launched before his soldiers' enlistments ran out on New Year's Day, January 1, 1776. Arnold and his 1,100 men arrived at Quebec City in November, a march that saw 300 men desert and go home with 200 who died on the march. He and his men were joined up with Montgomery's small force to prepare their attack. 
Arnold waited for Montgomery to arrive and support his force, but had no choice but to launch a desperate attack against the well-fortified Quebec City through a blizzard on December 31, 1775. Montgomery arrived late, with Arnold leading his men from the front. The return fire from the British defenders killed Montgomery, and Arnold's left femur was shattered by a musket ball. The chaplain, Reverend Samuel Spring, carried Arnold to the makeshift hospital at the Hotel Dieu. The surgeon contemplated the usual method for such a wound, amputation, but Arnold told him to bind the wound, saving his leg. Arnold was finally promoted to Brigadier General for reaching Quebec, and his remaining force maintained siege, tying the British down, until Major General David Worcester arrived to take over in April 1776. The Battle of Quebec failed, with hundreds of colonial soldiers killed, or wounded, or captured, and Canada remained in British hands. Arnold himself would walk with a slight limp after the wound healed, but it would not be the last time he was wounded in the same leg. Arnold blamed the dead Montgomery for not being there on time to provide the planned flanking diversionary fire, and he may have had a valid point. Meanwhile, the wounded Arnold went home to heal. Arnold was back in action when on October 11, 1776, the small American fleet surprised the British near Valcour Bay at Valcour Island. Although Major General Guy Carleton, the British governor of Quebec, had a few ships that drove the Americans away, he was being outflanked. Arnold had positioned his men to engage the British from the rear, then retreating in a fighting withdrawal, and then as the British pursued, Arnold continued the aggressive maneuver. These actions stalled Carleton and cost him casualties, and by the time he reached New York, winter was closing in and the British force returned to Canada. It was widely accepted and common knowledge that Arnold's command and control at Valker Island salvaged the colonial forces from potential disaster. Given his ability to take a bad situation and turn it into a good event, Saul Washington then assigned Arnold to defend Rhode Island after the British seized Newport in December 1776, where the local militia were too poorly equipped to attack the British. The winter lull halted major actions. Meanwhile, Arnold spent time with his children near his home in New Haven, and he spent much of that winter in Boston as well, where, in February 1777, Arnold was informed that he had been passed over by Congress for promotion to Major General. The main reason was that he had debts. But Arnold was not a favorite of many of his fellow generals, some of which were far less willing to risk their own skins in battle and had powerful friends in Congress. After Congress promoted five junior officers above him who had no such accomplishments and few had experience, Arnold once again resigned his commission in 1777. Arnold's financial situation leading to his indebtedness was primarily due to him paying his soldiers out of his own pocket and sending letters of reimbursement to Congress, which were refused. A conspiracy-minded person would conclude that Congress wanted him in debt to use that as a weapon against him. Arnold, being frustrated once again, submitted his resignation, stating why, and Washington refused to accept it. Washington saw his value and wrote to members of Congress in an attempt to correct this, noting that, quote, two or three other very good officers might be lost if they persisted in making politically motivated promotions. Washington knew Arnold's value and accomplishments, and he asked Arnold to reconsider that he would see to it he was promoted if at all possible, and Arnold relented. Arnold knew that he needed the rank to be more effective in commanding troops not subordinated to lesser men, and was back in time to participate in the defense of central New York from an invading British force under General Sir John Burgoyne in the fall of 1777. This time, Arnold would be subordinate to General Horatio Gates, and the two men openly detested each other. Arnold suspected a British attack on their left flank, and he wanted his men positioned there, but Gates disagreed, sending instead Daniel Morgan's men as a reconnaissance unit. Arnold knew quite well that if Morgan spotted the British, 
there would be little time to reinforce that flank. Then, Gates relieved Arnold of his command, giving it to Benjamin Lincoln. But Arnold effectively told him to go to hell and retook command, and he followed Morgan and established a skirmish line. Now, the historical sources conflict on the next action, but at the pivotal Battle of Bemis Heights, also called the Second Battle of Saratoga, in an assault against the British line on October 7, 1777, Arnold made history. Arnold's attack was one for the books, and his tactics were flawless, and his men took few casualties in comparison as his men fought a combination of rank-and-file battle with a flanking guerrilla-style warfare that totally confused the British, who lost at least 600 soldiers due to sniping by Morgan's and Arnold's men. It was considered a masterpiece of command, control, and maneuver, and Burgoyne surrendered his entire army at Saratoga 10 days later on October 17th. It was this victory, handed by Arnold, that convinced France to enter the war on the side of the Americans. In perhaps the greatest perceived betrayal by Arnold, Major General Gates wrote in his post-battle report that he himself had launched the attack and managed to destroy the British flank and then continued the flanking maneuver. Many other officers and the men knew the truth. Ironically, Gates had a hard time explaining how if he led the attack and, quote, Arnold remained behind in camp, end quote, how was Arnold again shot in the same left leg that had been shattered at Quebec? Due to this second crippling wound, he accepted the position as the military governor of Philadelphia in 1778. Arnold was on his way to Philadelphia when he was informed that the British were marching toward the main supply depot in Danbury, Connecticut. Now, Arnold was still unable to walk, but he organized a militia response from horseback, along with David Worcester and Connecticut Militia General Gold Selleck Silliman. Arnold then led a small militia group to interdict the British return to the coast in the Battle of Ridgeland. During this battle, he was wounded in his still healing left leg a third time, and Worcester was killed. When Arnold finally reached Philadelphia, he met with members of Congress carrying the letter from Washington about his rank. His success at Ridgeland and Washington's strong recommendation and the death of Worcester saw him promoted to Major General, although his seniority was not restored over those who had been promoted before him. While in Philadelphia, Arnold was also informed as to what was going on in Congress and the Army behind his back. During his term as governor, there were rumors accusing Arnold of abusing his position for his personal profit. Arnold's marriage to Peggy Shippen, the daughter of a man long suspected of loyalist sympathies, also raised concerns. They would have five children together, as she was from a wealthy family. They were accused of living a lavish lifestyle while accumulating substantial debt. However, Arnold's debt was easily explained because his men, as well as the soldiers of many other commanders, were not getting paid, which was in their contracts. Arnold learned that other generals were finally being given the money to pay their men, but not him. Arnold had a great loyalty to his men, and they were loyal to him. He began selling off many of his personal assets or taking loans against his properties to get the money to pay his men, many of whom had families to feed. He wrote to Congress constantly about this problem, wanting reimbursement, and he was refused every time. Despite his military successes, Arnold felt that he did not receive the recognition and respect he deserved, and that may be a valid concern. It was reported that many of his fellow senior officers stated in reports that Arnold was, quote, vain, emotional, and greedy. One officer stated that, Money is this man's God, and to get enough of it, he would sacrifice his country. Ironically, most of these accusations came from officers under the command of Horatio Gates, and many were filed after Benedict Arnold changed sides. Arnold, despite being promoted, still felt slighted, and he wrote out another letter of resignation on July 11th, which Washington again refused to accept, yet Arnold still felt that he never received the recognition he deserved. Many of his men, Still loyal but unable to provide for their families left the army, some rejoined other units that did receive payments. This was when 
Arnold's loyalties began to change. In 1779, Arnold entered into secret negotiations with the British, agreeing to turn over the garrison at West Point, New York, in return for money and rank in the British Army. This was the beginning of a secret correspondence between Arnold and Major John Andre, sometimes using his wife Peggy as a courier. Arnold knew that he was going to be court-martialed on charges of profiteering, for which there was no evidence. At no time during the proceedings was there any mention of Arnold making deals to pay his soldiers, which only his lawyer mentioned. As a result, Arnold was cleared of all but two very minor charges on January 26, 1780, but the die was cast. On August 3, 1780, Arnold was assigned the command of West Point and made a deal with British General Sir Henry Clinton. Knowing that Washington knew, Arnold fled to the HMS Vulture and sailed to New York City. From the ship, he wrote a letter to Washington requesting that Peggy, his wife, be given safe passage to her family in Philadelphia, which Washington granted. Major Andre was hanged at Tappan, New York on October 2nd. Washington also infiltrated men into the New York City area in an attempt to capture Arnold, who escaped sailing for Virginia in December and thus avoided capture. Arnold was paid 20,000 British pounds sterling and became a Brigadier General in the British Army, and he led British forces against Richmond, and they burned much of New London, Connecticut, and executed those who surrendered after the Battle of Groton Heights near where he had grown up. Benedict Arnold and wife Peggy moved to London, England in 1782, but in 1787, they moved to Canada to run a merchant business with his sons Richard and Henry, but soon they returned to London. On June 14, 1801, Benedict Arnold died at age 60 after a four-day fever and was buried at St. Mary's Church in Battersea, England. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.